Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of DM 101. This is the new weekly show that I do to help people who want to get into the art of dungeon mastering or games mastering, running games of things like Dungeons and Dragons or other tabletop RPGs. My name is Mark Humes, also known as Sherlock Humes, and I am the Dungeon Master for High Rollers, the weekly D&D stream over on twitch.tv forward slash yogscast. Um, it's every Sunday at 5pm GMT. We're just coming up on two years now of streaming. Um, we've had some awesome times. We've done some work with wizards. We've grown considerably. We've you know had a crazy campaign, and it's all available on YouTube. If you've not checked it out yet, you can find it on the Yogs Live channel. I will put a link in the description below down to the playlist so if you'd like to catch up you can do so there but come along join us it's been a heck of a ride and you can see all of my dungeon mastering in one place but enough of that let's move on to today's episode now today's episode was going to be focused on it was going to be the first part of a series which was going to help you kind of create your own custom world talking about the processes things to think about but due to a lot of comments I've received, both here in YouTube and on Twitter, a lot of people have been asking me to talk about how I structure notes for a game, for a tabletop role-playing game. Um, the session notes, the world notes, that sort of thing. And I realized that actually we, that's something we should cover before we go into the bigger process of creating worlds and creating adventures and everything else. It's a good idea to kind of have in your mind how to structure those notes and everything else. So hopefully this will be a useful video to people out there. Now, one thing I wanna make clear is this is just my way of doing things. Uh, I will talk a little bit about other ways and point you in the direction of some other people who talk about note preparation and everything else, but I'm gonna share with you my method for doing this. It's not gonna work for everybody. There is no one right way to do all of this. Instead, it's gonna very much depend on your gaming group. Um, I'm a firm believer in that every single group of D&D will need to be you know, adjusted for, and, and you're gonna change the way that you do preparation, that you do improvisation, that you do the content of those adventures. You know, people are very different. So there's no one right way of doing this. What instead, to me, session notes and world notes what your what your notes for running a game of DD are there for is as references reminders uh, refreshers guidelines something to spark the creativity um, during that game they can provide you with clear information as well but it's my belief that in tabletop role-playing games, it is inevitable that you will have to improvise at some point. So instead, your session notes should be there that if the players decide to do something else, you know vaguely what might happen in that area, or you've got something that you can quickly change and reskin and put it over there anyway. So that's kind of what I think notes should be, and you'll see a little bit more what I mean as we actually break the notes down completely, um, but that's my opinion. So whenever you're making your notes, even if my method doesn't work for you try and keep in mind that that's something that you want to be looking at like how can I get the information I need that if I need to make something up I, I still have everything I need available to me so that's something to, to keep in mind um, we're gonna be talking about two specific types of notes here we're gonna be talking about session notes uh, which is what you actually use to sit down and play a session of, of tabletop role-playing game or Dungeons and Dragons, whatever it happens to be. So when you sit down for your two, three, four hour game, whatever it happens to be, your session notes are what you need to know for that time period. The other half is your world notes, and this is the wider world. This is information about the governments and the factions and the gods and the history and how magic works and everything else. Um, and those are very separate. To me, the world notes are supplementary, and that is what you build your session notes from. It might be something you pull out in the game to look something up, but generally your session notes are what you're focused on, and then this is off to the side to be used if you need it. Now, uh, we're going to talk about a few things. We'll talk about the actual formats. I'll show you examples of how I, I lay out all my notes and things like that. Um, the other thing we're going to talk about is cheat sheets. Uh, these are little pieces of information that is very useful to have. Um, they're not specifically session notes or world notes. They are something that you can quickly grab, almost like a reference guide or something that can help you quickly generate things. Um, we'll talk a little bit about those. The next thing I'm going to talk about, though, is the tools that you can use. So, you know, the online tools, word processing tools, etc., that you can actually use to start building out your campaigns because there's a few good options um, which you might not have thought about. 
I will put in the video description timestamps to all of these parts. So if you're interested in any of them, you can just jump in and check those out. So let's start talking about some of the tools you can use to prep your D&D games. So time was back in the day when D&D was on the rise before it got mega popular and before really the digital age kind of took, took hold. DMs would carry massive ring binders or notebooks full of their homebrew worlds, their session notes, everything else with sticky notes and index cards and everything else to kind of help them contain all of that information. We now live in an age where you don't need to do that. You still can if you want to. If you want to do that, there is something satisfying about having a big ring binder of handwritten notes and hand-drawn maps. I think that that is personally quite cool. I just don't have the patience for it. But we now live in a digital age, and there is a bunch of really useful, cool tools out there to help you not only keep track of your notes but also sharing them, organizing them, etc., etc. I personally use Google Docs. It's free, it's available to pretty much everybody, and it provides you with everything you kind of need just to get the real basics. It's got a word processor, it's got organization tools, you can break things down into folders, different documents, you've got pretty good space with it. It's also, you can easily share it with your players, you can create documents just for the players and then send it. You can even send it to individual players if you need to. And also, it's just got a bunch of other things. If you do want to use a spreadsheet, you can add a th you can throw a spreadsheet in there, you can do a presentation. It's a fairly robust but simple tool. What I tend to do is create a folder for that campaign, and then inside that folder there'll be folders for locations, for you know, world history, for session notes, custom monsters, etc. And I kind of shuffle them all up and, and organize them that way. But Google Docs is pretty basic. If you wanted something a bit more involved, one program I see heavily, heavily recommended, especially on the D&D subreddit, is Microsoft's OneNote. OneNote is very similar to Google Drive in that you can update it from anywhere, you can you know, work on it in one place, it saves to the cloud, then you can work on it from home, etc., etc. But it just has a few more organizational tools that will make it stand out. You can color code different tabs in a single document, you can have sidebars, you can organize things, and it's just generally a pretty useful tool to have. Other programs you can use, there is a program that novel writers and writers use called Scrivener. Now, Scrivener unfortunately doesn't have the cloud save, kind of like upload it anywhere, take it anywhere functionality of something like Google Docs or Microsoft OneNote, but if you're pretty much using the same laptop and you're running your games from the laptop and you're carrying your laptop around with you, Scrivener could be a good choice. Not only is it a wonderful word processing document, but it's also got great organization. You can actually break things down into your manuscript, which you can make your session notes and have different pages for different uh, sessions, but you can also have sections for your research, for your homebrew world notes. You can have a sidebar which gives you kind of quick at a glance information and you can export it all as one PDF or one document to print out if you ever wanted to as well. It's pretty good. Uh, there is a free trial available to it, but you do have to buy it for the full version. It is a cool program, um, interesting to see. The nice thing I like about Scrivener is in the, if you click on sort of like the head tab, the kind of like headline tab, it breaks down all of your individual documents into index cards, which can all have summary information written on them. This can be quite useful in that you could break down locations and then on the index cards just have like, you know, maybe four or five lines of text just to give you a bit more information. And then it means you can quickly find stuff really, really easily, as opposed to stuff like Google Docs where you just see a thumbnail. The next thing I'm gonna talk about does require a bit more sort of web knowledge, maybe a little bit of website development uh, sort of ideologies, but there are Wikipedia building tools. So you can build your own wiki for your own custom world um, and even you can use it a little bit for your session notes. The nice thing with these is if you do upload it to the web, it's obviously something you can share with your players and they can add to it themselves and it can create this kind of like, hey, this is our wiki for our cool world, etc., etc. There are also websites out there that offer these kind of services, kind of campaign organization. D&D Beyond has a little bit of this that you can play into as well, but they tend to be a bit more sort of minimalized. They don't have the robustness of these other features. You can also use things like Trello, which is a kind of to-do list noteboard. 
I'll talk a little bit about this later, but if you're interested in the lazy DM method by Sly Flourish, Trello boards can be a good kind of uh, replacement for things like index cards. So that's another one you can check out. It basically has a number of columns that you can then split individual to-do list tasks or note boards into, and then you can run your games from them. The idea of it is to have one column for like locations, one column for NPCs, one column for treasure, one column for encounters, and then you're just grabbing at the pieces that you need to fit the, the actual situation that the players find themselves in. Those are all the different ways that you can kind of, the different services you can use to collate your notes. But what about the actual format? And I know this is the main thing people want me to talk about. Well, to do that, we're going to have to go to our good old friend, the whiteboard. Wow, I really feel like a drama teacher in this section, thanks to my, well, whiteboard plus drama teacher cardigan. I really feel like a teacher this time. So, uh, let's go to our good friend, the whiteboard here, um, and we're going to talk about session notes first, specifically. So, how do I break these down? Imagine this is a Word document, and we're going to be typing these out. When I start a session, this is pointless, but it's mainly relevant because I want to go through the whole thing. I'll start off with, you know, session name or episode name. For me, that's a bit different because obviously being a stream, I do break it down into episodes. Um, and then this will just be the form that will form the header or whatever of the episode. The first thing I actually write relevant to you guys is a small recap. Now, this will take about four or five bullet points. So we'll have, you know, bullet point, bullet point, bullet point. We'll do three. And this will be kind of general summaries of what happened last time. Um, players went to city. Uh, players killed Duke's son. And then um, found lead on cult. Very loose. Obviously, they'll be more detailed for your specific things, but at that sort of level of detail, like three bullet points or four or five bullet points that just give you sort of the key things that the players accomplished, the things the players might want to look into further, and also things that can cause the players more complications and consequences. The middle one is a good example of this. It's a good reminder to me that the Duke of whoever the Duke's son you know, whoever whoever the father was, the Duke is probably going to try and cause trouble for the PCs, is going to come after them for a bit of revenge, might try and get them arrested, might try and get them assassinated, who knows, it's something for me to bear in mind, it's something that I could throw in as a bit of a curveball to them. So a recap I find is very useful, um, and it's good having it at the top because it gets you thinking for the rest of everything else. So that's the first thing I do. When I actually break down the session notes, I break it down into locations. So I don't write it out like, and then the players are going to do this, and then the players are going to do this, and then the players are going to do this. The reason I don't do that is because it, you're setting yourself up there for failure if the players decide they want to do something else. And you're going to be frustrated if you make all these detailed plans and you plan this cool encounter and this cool thing, and the players just never go there. Sly Flourish in his Lazy DM series mentions this. Over-preparing, putting too much effort, too much planning into these session notes can really be disheartening because players do what players do. They're going to go off and explore and they're going to follow what they think is the right lead and it might not be. If you're trying to force a story down their throats, you got to revise how you do it because you're probably not going to enjoy that. If you do, you do, that's up to you, but try and think of it in this way. Now, this is why I break everything down into locations and I generally don't do more than three or four locations per session notes. Um, and I focus on the current location, nearby locations, and likely locations. I'll talk a little bit more about these. So current location is pretty obvious. That's where the players happen to be from the last session. It could be a dungeon. It could be a city. It could be a temple. It could be anywhere, right? So that's the current location. 
Um, it could be that they're inside a dungeon and the current location is a specific room. So uh, we'll put down here uh, wherever... Oh god, my spelling. The players happen to be. Okay, so that's current location. Nearby locations, another obvious one. It's anywhere nearby that the player that is near the current location. This could be another town, um, a village, uh, an interesting location, like a monument or a natural uh, thing. Um, interesting locale, a forest, it could be a dungeon, a temple, whatever, etc. Okay, so anywhere nearby that, especially if you're describing sort of the surrounding area, the players might see. So if you're kind of like, oh, you know, you leave the city heading towards the mountains and you know that along the way there is an old ruined tower at the edge of the lake that overlooks everything and you happen to describe that tower. This is where the second one, the third option here comes in. You've got to try and anticipate your party a little bit. You've got to think, okay, if I describe this tower to them, because I know it's there, it has a reason for being there, are they going to go to it? Some players will just beeline straight to that tower. They'll go, interesting new thing. Do, 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 and they'll go straight there. Other players will go like, well, that's not relevant to what we're doing. Carry on. And then they'll just carry on. It might sound like, therefore, working on some of these nearby locations is a waste of time. Why bother mentioning it? Why bother planning for it? That seems like a waste of time. And, and it could be. It could be. However, with a little trick that we'll talk about in future episodes uh, called reskinning, those locations that you work on that you don't get to use in a session, you save. And you maybe throw them in later. You keep these session notes because if the players end up going like, well, we're going to go off and do this. And you're like, oh, I don't have any you know, notes for a kind of like small dungeon or a, a wizard's laboratory or anything like that. Oh, wait, hang on. I designed that tower ages ago that they never went to. Boom. You've suddenly got something that you can quickly reskin, vamp up, do whatever you need to do to make it more relevant. Likely locations then is places you think the players are going to go. And this is normally based around the recap itself. So, for example, let's use this one, right? Our players went to the city, so that's their current location. The players killed the Duke's son. Maybe the Duke's manor is a nearby location. That's something we probably might want to know about. Um, found lead on cult. Let's say that that lead happened to be, like, uh, caverns nearby, right? Um, that becomes a likely location. Our players are probably going to explore that. They're probably going to try and investigate that. So it's probably a location we need to plan. This is all pretty obvious stuff, I know. I'm not being particularly revealing any kind of massive secrets. And that's because there are no massive secrets to all of this. It's just about breaking it down. You know, making sure you have the likely locations that you think your players are going to go. Having nearby locations that if the players go off the beaten track they're going to head towards, and then having the current location where you might throw in some curveballs, you might throw in some encounters, that sort of thing. So I tend to break it down. I will normally have, I'll put it here, uh, three to five of these. Um, that will vary depending on how much time I think they'll spend on this, right? So, you know, if I think that actually they're going to be spending most of their time in the current location. They're not going to go out anywhere. They're not going to find anywhere new. I might spend more time. I might only come up with one or two other things and then spend most of my time on the current location. Um, it's going to vary. If it's a very exploration kind of campaign, you might want more than five. You might need more. Um, so that's worth bearing in mind. So once we've actually... Right, so that's how, you know, the kinds of locations I might talk about. How do I actually break this down? The other thing I want to point out as well is this doesn't just have to be cities and things like that. That can be dungeons, everything else. Um, that for with dungeons, the nearby and likely locations might become rooms in a large dungeon complex. Like if you've got a big sort of like 
15 room dungeon, their current location might be this section or that section. So therefore the nearby locations and like locations are gonna be nearby, you know, sort of adjacent rooms or other sections into the dungeon that are close by, etc., etc. You probably don't need to worry in depth about like the floor below, um, if you don't think they're gonna get there this turn, but it might be worth just having a few notes, etc., etc. Right, so um, I'm going to wear raise. I'm going to use, have to use my sleeve because I don't actually have um, a eraser. I should probably get one, shouldn't I, if I'm going to keep using this whiteboard. So uh, now I've re-raised that. How do I actually break the locations down? Well, it kind of works a little bit like this. I'll put the name of the location as a sort of hub subheader. Name of location. Like so. Under this, under the subheader, I will put a um, short piece of info slash law about the location. For style purposes, I tend to italicize this just so it reminds me that it's a short and snappy piece of law. This is just to really jog my memory about what I've already planned in my head. So it could be a bit about the history, it could be like if it's a city, kind of its main sort of trades or key features, unusual features about it. Anything which is gonna help remind me and describe this location to the players and kind of get their interest in it, right? So that's kind of that. This might also, uh, I might put a picture. Um, so I might often, like Google or Pinterest, a cool piece of fantasy art. I put it in my notes. It's not for me to share with the players, although you could do this. It's more to help me get a visual idea so I can describe it better. Um, so popping like a little picture off to the side in a different column or maybe just underneath the italicized text um, just gives me something that I can quickly help help me describe and stuff like that. So that's it. So you've got the name of the location, short piece of information or lore about it. Um, I tend to do this, you know, just to give myself enough that I know about it, right? After that, uh, under a new sort of subheading, underneath that particular location, so imagine that you've kind of got like major sort of like subheader. This is kind of a more minor subheader. I put NPCs. Um, next to locations, NPCs are the next most interesting thing um, that players will care about. The thing with NPCs is uh, even in a dungeon, um, you should have these even in dungeons. In dungeons or wilderness. I can do it. There we go. So the reason I stay this is because it's very easy to just think of dungeons as places for traps and encounters and not much else. Um, the thing is, is even in dungeons, you can still have great role-playing encounters and social encounters that make that make it more interesting for the party. Not everybody loves combat, not everybody loves social encounters, but you should try and kind of always have a good mix of the two wherever you can. So important to have NPCs that they can interact with effectively. Um, under this, so under NPCs, I normally will do a similar thing of name, uh, goal, this is a uh, goal, yeah, that's an important one. Um, and then a bit of information about them. Okay, so let's break this down a little bit. God, this is getting a bit messy, isn't it? I have to get some whiteboard cleaner, but yeah. So uh, NPCs, name, goal, information about them. So name's an obvious one, what's their name? Uh, it might be that they are the bugbear chieftain that rules over the dungeon. It might be that they are the duke of a certain kingdom whose son the party just killed. It can be anybody, right? Anybody that you think has relevant importance to that session, okay? You do not need to put every single NPC under this section. We'll come more to that in cheat sheets. You don't need to have the blacksmith's name, the general store name, the tavern owner's name, the blah blah blah's name. You don't need to have all of that information. This should be for people who are relevant to what is going on in those locations, who are important to those locations that you think will mean something to the players, right? Again, a lot of this is coming down to how well you know your group and how well you know your players and their play style. 
it is something which you just get better at the more you do it, okay? So name, the goal is probably actually the most important thing you can put down for a for a, an NPC. The goal is one of the most important things you can think about for an NPC because that's really what makes NPCs a bit different. Every NPC has a goal. That goal might be simply make money as a business, support my family. It might be I want to get out of, uh, I want to escape this life as a goblin and go see the surface. It could be I want to kill all the adventurers that come here and take their stuff. Every NPC should have a goal, right? This is what helps you improvise social interactions with them. When you don't know what to say as an NPC, if you know what that NPC's goal is, you have something to work towards. If that NPC's goal is they want to learn what the party knows about an artifact because they're secretly working for the giant cult or their goal might be support the cult of Vecna in any way possible. Well, they might wanna learn more about the PCs. They'll gather information about them. They might wanna try and kill them in their sleep. These are all things that you can be thinking about to kind of lure them into their, their course of action, right? So I think that's actually a really important one to have. The third piece is information about them, very similar to the uh, name, name of the location stuff where it's like a short couple of sentences at most, um, normally italicized. It's anything interesting about them. Um, you know, uh, this could be uh, Duke of the Duke of Kingsley. Uh, his goal is to run an effective kingdom, keep his troublesome son um, safe. Information about him, uh, the Duke loves his son because his wife died and now he's the only thing that's left of him, but he's troubled the reports that his son may be working for a secret cult. Um, he has assembled a group of priests in secret to monitor his behavior. Something like that, right? That is not only going to give you a goal that you know that that player is going to work, so that NPC is going to work towards. That information gives you more stuff that you can drop plot hooks in. You might have the players who killed the Duke's son might get attacked or interrogated by one of these priests, one of these secret clerics that the, the, the Duke has sent to keep an eye on his son. They might come in retribution thinking that they're, you know, actually members of the cult or something like that. That can lead to more information. There's a plot hook there about the Duke's son being a member of this cult. How far does it go? Did anybody know about it? Blah, 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 blah. These are very good for plot hooks, this like little short bit of sentence, and it also gives you a bit more flavor for that NPC. I normally throw in here um, notes about their, that is an O, notes about their appearance. Um, voices, etc. Uh, I like doing NPC voices. Um, this is a good point to note what they should sound like as a reminder. <laughs> As you've probably seen if you've watched any of the High Roller stuff, sometimes I do forget. So it's a very good thing to have uh, something like that there to go. This will again be broken down per location. So name the location, you might have you know, five or six really important NPCs. Um, I would say anywhere between, again, sort of three to six uh, of these, depending on the location. Um, just gives you enough interesting people that the players can go and speak to um, and find information out from. So that is that for NPCs. After NPCs, and I'm hoping I should have enough space for this one, um, I might have to wipe the board a bit in a second. Um, after NPCs, I make a section for encounters. Now, it's very easy to think I'm talking um, solely about combat encounters here, but I'm not. This is both combat encounters in fact actually it's three things combat encounters social encounters and finally this is only sometimes relevant traps or puzzles now some GMs don't like to plan this out too much they just want stat blocks. And then if a combat takes place, it takes place. I like to have planned encounters, both combat, social, and then traps and puzzle, mental, mental encounters. The reason I like to do this is because it can change the pacing of a game. If you think that things are slowing down, the players don't really know what to do, um, this is a, it's a theory called kick in the door, uh, where you have somebody kick in the door to the tavern and start a fight. 
Um, and then that encounter gives them clues to put them back on the right track for this. And you want to tie it back into sort of like, you know, the perfect example of this that we've kind of got ongoing. Um, the players have found a lead on the cult, but they don't know what to do about the Duke's son. Like, they're trying to avoid the, the police, they're trying to avoid the guard, but they know that he's connected somehow and they want to explore that. Players are getting a bit stuck, they don't really know what to do. They don't want to leave the city because they're afraid they're going to get caught, but they can't really go after the cult. So they're kind of at a bit of a loss. Well, we know, thanks to our NPC information, our Duke has, you know, this secret group of priests um, who have been following the prince. Hey, that sounds like the perfect time to kick in the door. The priests assault the players in their tavern, thinking that they're criminals or assassins or maybe just trying to seek revenge. They kick in the door to start a fight. Maybe it turns into a social encounter halfway through because a player's just like, whoa, 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 hang on, no, we found this evidence. Look, we've got evidence that he's a member of this cult, blah, 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 blah. The priests suddenly become allies. They can then help the players get out of the city to go to a nearby location, to go to the caverns, boom, 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 boom. All leads into each other. So I like to have comp planned combat encounters. The other reason I like to plan combat social and mental encounters is it allows you to make them a bit more interesting. Um, we'll talk about how to make combat encounters uh, interesting in a future episode because it is literally something I could talk a whole video about. But you know, this lets you plan like, okay, what's the terrain, you know, like cool features. Uh you know, um, any kind of magic stuff. You know, this is, think of this like the kind of writing the interesting things for the encounters like level design for video games. Like where are your exploding red barrels gonna be? Where are your rotating platforms gonna be? Where's your, you know, um, midway, midway phase change for the boss monster? You know, that sort of thing. Um, how are they gonna change up their behavior? And you can even apply some of the thinking behind this to social encounters as well. You know, maybe halfway through, if the players say the right things, the meaner of the noble woman suddenly changes. She starts trying a different tactic. Maybe there are elements, magical elements at play, which make it harder or easier on the players, that sort of thing. So generally, and these encounters will be specific to that location. So it might be the priests that are gonna attack the players um, at some point during the day. It might be the dungeon, uh, the trap room inside the dungeon in that certain section or something like that. Um, it could be the social encounter at the Duke's Manor for the Masquerade Ball. Um, these are all be tied to this. So this, think of this as your big subheader and then these are your smaller, um, so smaller bullet points underneath it, right, okay? So we got that, we got that, we got that. So let's clean the board because I've got a few more things to talk about on this. Okay, so I just cleaned the board a little bit just so we've got some more room. So, after NPCs and encounters, not on the actual document itself, and I'll talk about why. Uh, I also put, you could put it, in fact, we'll put it under here as a subtitle, but I'll talk a bit about that in a second, is stat blocks. So, stat blocks, if you're not familiar, uh, this is basically like the little box of information you see in the, the monster manual um, that provides all the stats for a monster, an NPC, that sort of thing. Now, you could put this in the document, but it will bulk it out quite a lot. Really, your whole notes, I'll talk about that in a second. Stat blocks, I actually prefer to write on uh, index cards. So if you index cards, they're the little kind of like square kind of pieces of card, uh, normally for filing systems and things like that. They come ruled or blank. Um, I prefer to use those because it allows quicker access and it doesn't clog up the rest of your notes with stat blocks. Um, you can also chop and change them in quite easily. Easier to search. Um, you can color code these. which is what I like to do. Um, I color code them for combat social and mental. So if I've got a trap, I might put it on like blue or something like that. Um, magic items I might put on yellow, you know, social might go on green and then combat goes on red. Um, and it just helps you kind of quickly find what you're looking for. Um, so index cards uh, for stat blocks I tend to use, or you could write them out on a document. I do recommend splitting into columns if you can, just to help try and save on a little bit of space. Um, I'll put a little note on that on there. Split into columns. That's probably spelt wrong. That's massively spelt wrong. Um, on Word docs. Um, 
So that's something I would do separately on index cards. It just kind of helps you kind of keep, um, yeah, just keep your notes nice and clean, really. After stat blocks, under encounters, really, for me, um, possible rewards. Now, again, like combat, you might be thinking like, oh, he means treasure. I do. I do mean treasure. Treasure is definitely one of these. Whether that's gold, magic items, etc. So treasure is 100% one of these. I think it's good to work out treasure ahead of time. You can roll for it. You can determine it randomly. Or you can make stuff up. We'll talk about that in a future episode. Um, but it's important to know what the treasure is, where it can be found, how it relates to everything else in that location. Um, but I'm also not necessarily just talking about treasure. Um, it can also be new information. It can be allies. Uh, sure, that spells allies. Um, <laughs> so new information, it can be new leads. It could be, you know, a new lead on the cult of Vecna, or it could be new information about the Duke's son. Um, maybe he was possessed, maybe he's a doppelganger, um, all of these kind of things. Allies can be, you know, friends and people that will come and aid them. It can be, you know, possible rewards, you know, completing a quest chain might earn them a friendly face that they can go to, gives them a discount on things, or, you know, gives them more information, heals them when they need it. Um, these are possible rewards. Uh, they can also be player specific. So, if you've got a player's black backstory, uh, that you can tie in, maybe completing something in this location can provide that player with, with some sort of reward. These don't necessarily have to be tied into completing quests. These can just be things that they can earn at this location. This is the main thing. This is why I put everything under this one single uh, header is because, you know, the treasure could be bought from a store. It could be found. It could be given by the Duke for whoever destroys the cult. The new information can just be found. It could be like you speak to the right NPC, you get new information. Um, allies, same thing. Pop player specific, same thing. You know, players trying to track down their lost sister. Hey, maybe one of the NPCs or one of the social encounters can provide some of that information. So I think having that under your notes is also quite important. And that forms pretty much what my notes will look like. Three or five of these with these kind of breakdowns. Again, you're talking about, uh, let's switch to a different color pen just to highlight this out. So NPCs, anywhere between three and six, I would say is a good number. Locations, um, you're talking about three to five, but again, it will vary. Encounters, this can change. This is very dependent on what the players are up to and what they've been doing. Um, I tend to have sort of two to three um, of these. Um, per location so and locations I wouldn't necessarily do each dungeon room is like this I would maybe do do dungeon sections like this you know have like a couple of things broken down um, two to three of those depending on what it is um, if it is a dungeon you know maybe minimize this stat blocks will be completely relevant to this um, and then possible rewards this is really a potluck um, it depends on what you're doing at the time it can vary <laughs> So that is pretty much how I break down my notes. Location, NPCs, encounters, possible rewards, and then I have index cards for stat blocks. That helps me. It provides me all the information I need, but I will improvise and make up a lot of stuff. I might improvise descriptions. I might have to change some of these up rapidly, reskin them. Maybe the Duke's actually the, the URT because of something the players have done or said or something I've done and said by accident. So it really varies. That helps me. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is not the world notes. I'm actually going to talk about cheat sheets. Cheat sheets are reference documents um, that provide you with information that you need to come up with content on the fly. So an obvious one of these uh, is NPC names. In fact, let's wipe the board and I'll write these out. Okay, let's talk about cheat sheets. So one of the most obvious ones, and I've talked about this in the first episode, the D&D Basics episode, is NPC names. So having a document with just loads of NPC names on it 
is so helpful. There are so many times in high rollers where the players ask me for somebody's name and I've had to make something up on the spot and it's really dumb, like Bob or Jim or I don't know, something like that. Or two play or two NPCs have extremely similar or even the same name and then people start thinking like, oh, is there something on there? It's like, no, I just didn't come up with a very good name. So having a, a reference sheet for NPC names, very, very useful. You probably want to rotate this um, every now and then. Just change it up. Um, there's loads of fancy name generators. People are always asking me, like, how do you come up with fancy names? Fancy name generator into Google, go through it. It comes up with a lot of garbage, but occasionally you get a good one and then you write that down. You might see a garbage one, but then it sparks your imagination and you come up with something else. Um, fancy name generators I tend to use quite a lot just to come up with dumb names. Um, yeah, that's it. You can also just use, you know, media culture, stuff like that. Just write a list of names if you really want to. The next one... Um, which is kind of an unusual one, I think, uh, is NPC Motivations. So, this one. This can seem a bit daunting in a way. Having a random list that you can roll on or that you pick from of full motivations, you might be thinking, well, that doesn't sound like very simple. Well, you can break them down. Um, this is very useful to me because, again, knowing what that NPC's motivation is helps you define their roleplay and their interactions with the party. What they want, what they're trying to accomplish, um, can change very much how they interact with everybody else. The kind of things they say, the way they behave, everything else. I like to break this down a little bit further. And I kind of have it broken down into mundane... Nefarious, I'm going to spell this wrong, I'm sure. And magical. If I'm going to have a list of random ones, um, I like breaking it down into these three points. Um, because, so mundane is your normal everyday stuff, right? This is make money. This is raise a family. No, this is not get killed. That's pretty normal stuff, right? This helps embed a sort of sense of realism in the location of the NPC. If they're talking to a farmer, it's not always the best idea to give them a magical one. It can be, but not always. So having a list of mundane motivations just kind of gives it for those random things. They start talking to the baker. Like, oh, Mr. Baker, hmm, what, do you, what do you do in this city? Oh, I just... Making money for my family. It's been in my family for generations. Blah, blah, blah. That sort of thing, right? Nefarious is where it starts to get a bit more fun. Uh, nefarious is obviously they're up to something. It can not necessarily always be like, I'm a secret serial killer murderer. <laughs> it could just be wants to rip people off. Um, you know, it could be uh, is a member of a cult. It could be working for the enemy. Etc. Right? Nefarious is all the sort of evil alignment, sort of like they're untrustworthy, they're probably going to be lying through their teeth, they're going to want to try and get something out of the players. Um, and this is fun. It creates minor villains. Um, it, again, is a little bit more realistic. It's, you know, you can't trust everybody. Not everybody's on your side. So having a list of, like, random nefarious motivations can be good. And again, this can tie into your location notes and things like that. Going back to our one about the whole Duke's son and the cult. If, you're, if the players are suddenly talking to the Apocryphy, um, and you're like, oh, I didn't expect them to talk to this guy. Potions maker, uh, come up with a random name. What can I ooh, motivate? Oh, mem maybe he's a member of the cult. And, you know, he's heard about the, the prince's death. He's annoyed. Maybe he's going to try and poison the party. If they find out and they capture him, he can then maybe give them a clue, which leads them on, which gives them more information, um, etc., etc. So that can be quite a fun one to work with as well. Magical is, uh, we're going to have to kind of do it down here. Magical is one where you can go really crazy. And this is the stuff that I think that these little moments where you have these random things 
are some of the most memorable stuff that you'll get out of your D&D campaigns. It's the stuff that players love and adore for ages. I'm going to give you some examples of this from actual plays. So, uh, for example, I once had a spectator in High Rollers, which is a type of monster, um, who had been, uh, who had gone mad um, uh, due to loneliness. Uh, loneliness. Sure, that's how you spell loneliness. Um, so I had a character who had gone mad due to loneliness and that formed his motivations. Um, and so he wanted the players to stay with him and talk to him forever and they had to convince him to let them go. Became one of the most well-loved NPCs I've ever used because he was so funny, the players thought it was really unusual, everything else. I once played in a game um, where I had a mouse companion. I had a little tiny mouse that uh, I, it was like a trinket I rolled or something like that. The DM had it that it was, um, it uh, is secretly a dragon, uh, true polymorphed. Okay. When that mouse got dispelled or something like that, dispel magic was cast on it, it turned back into a dragon. It was one of the most thing. it was the thing I remember most, is having this little mouse companion that was with me the whole time, suddenly becomes a dragon, and chats to us and gives us information and everything else. Um, really kind of fun sort of thing to kind of incorporate. Um, it could be not necessarily as mundane, but uh, wants to be a wizard. Again, works really well. Um, if you've got a goblin and you have a little goblin NPC in a, in a dungeon or something like that, um, and you are like, they start talking to it like, you, what, what, what are you doing? Like, why are you trying to kill these people? And it's just a shitty level one goblin and it's got really nothing to do. It's kind of a bit of a nobody. Maybe it's, maybe it doesn't want to be a bandit. Maybe it's kind of been bullied into being a bandit. It actually just wants to be a wizard. Uh, and the party will take pity on it. It will become their friend and they'll train him up to be a little goblin wizard. And you've got a funny little NPC that will go around with a party. So these kind of having a random list of these motivations can really help kind of create those crazy, memorable moments that players absolutely love. And this can all come from a cheat sheet. Just write out a big list of it and then just pick stuff. Um, it will massively help. Uh, lastly, I'm gonna go down here. Um, I'm trying to think of the way to phrase this. So, uh, cool locations. Okay, now, um, well actually no, not locations. Oh my God, that's awful. I should not have used my thumb. Uh, cool vignettes. This is the one. This is actually something I talk about quite a lot in Twitter and stuff when people ask me for advice, especially when they're GMing for the first time. Come up with a cheat sheet of maybe three to five cool vignettes. Now a vignette is a small scene. Um, this might involve um, some sort of conflict or problem. Uh, an NPC. Um, and then some sort of encounter. Right? And that, that vignette can be nearly anything. That could be a little girl's pet homunculus is stuck up a tree. Sounds dumb. But when the players are wandering around, they're in the city, they're in the town, they're kind of a bit sort of like plodding along, like there's nothing really going on, they don't really pursue it. You can throw this in as a way to just spice things up. Not to really give them anything, just to make the world feel a bit more real, um, something to do. If the players go looking for something, if they're like, yeah, I want to wander around the town and see if I can get any information, rather than just go, you know, roll a persuasion check, yeah, you learn this. Why not have one of these cool vignettes take place? You know, the little girl's homunculus is stuck up the tree. The players, you know, jump in, they help out. The little girl might give them some possible reward information. I should probably put on here. No, that's not even readable. I don't even know what I'm doing there. Uh, reward. This will probably not be something you can plan in this kind of uh, random section. Uh, in this kind of cheat sheet. This will be something you'll have to come up with on the spot. But it's good to have a reward for. And these vignettes can be anything. Um, it could be the players visit a cool shrine in a temple or in a forest or whatever. And if they solve a riddle, an encounter, a mental encounter, they get an answer from a spirit, 
a, a fey spirit, right? Boom, 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 boom. They get a reward. It makes that journey feel more worthwhile. And it's something you can just throw into anywhere. Like if you literally have, you know, shrine, um, the conflict is, uh, it's been abandoned um, because it's supposedly haunted. There's a spirit who, if you answer a riddle, does a thing. You could throw that into anywhere. That could be in a temple in the city, could be in a forest, could be in a dungeon, could be in a lake, could be absolutely anywhere. So having that cheat sheet of these cool vignettes will really, really help. Um, and it kind of gives you some cool stuff to build on. So there you go, that is it for cheat sheets. The last thing I'm gonna talk about in this video, and I know it's gonna be a little bit of a long one, um, the last thing I'm gonna talk about in this video, we're not gonna go into too much detail on it, we're gonna talk a little bit about world notes and some of the categories you might wanna think about when building up your own world. Okay, last thing we're gonna talk about, and I'm gonna try and go through this quick because this is turning into a long video and there's a lot of stuff I don't wanna cut out of it. So, world notes. We will talk about this in more detail in episodes as we go on. Um, there's gonna be a lot of stuff happening um, as we go through the series and a lot of this stuff we're gonna actually cover as we talk about that. So, uh, let me just go over this. So when I'm creating this, when I'm building up a new campaign setting, a new world, um, I tend to break it into these sorts of categories. And the first one, is world layout slash map. It's actually one of the first things I start thinking about. Even if I don't have it fully realized, I think about the layout of the world. And if that means that can occasionally mean um, designing a map as well. Um, this can affect a lot of the other stuff. That can affect how fa factions work, how wars work, how everything else works. You know, geography is a huge part of, of world building and it's worth thinking about. Um, it helps you develop cultures, it helps you develop sort of ideas, everything else, right? So that's one thing to think about. The next thing is world history and creation myth. So, world history, um, this is actually going to be one of the first things we talk about because in this, there is something really significant that I think is the kind of foundations of building campaign worlds, which is recent events that have changed or shaped the world. That's something really important to think about. The creation myth can be especially important if your world has a lot of custom religious stuff um, or custom world stuff. This can be very important to think about because it, it is so important to religions, to cultures, to everything else. So that is definitely something you should be aware of and you know be thinking about it doesn't necessarily need to be a myth it can be creation truth it can be you know the gods did this and they told everybody and it is accepted as truth um it's been magically proven that this is correct that's fine you can do that but it's worth knowing exactly what that's going to be uh also worth thinking about gods now, this doesn't just mean you have to create your own pantheon. You can use existing gods. Um, however, if you do that, if using D&D &D gods, how do they fit? How do they fit in? Right? So that's you need to think about that. If you're using the D&D &D gods from the base setting, the Greyhawk gods or the Forgotten Realms gods or whatever, how do they fit into your world? What purposes do they plan? How do things change? How are things different? Why is your world different here? So that's one thing to think about. Uh, in a similar way, races. So again, if you're not customizing, if you're not having completely whole new races, um, how do they work? You know, uh, how do they fit in? How have they developed? You know, all things to think about, very, very much worth thinking about. Uh, factions. What kind of factions are in your world? Things like thieves' guilds, governments, religions. Remember, religions don't always have to be about gods, the actual physical gods that exist in the world. Um, uh... I'm trying to think, or organizations, like um, gov uh, trade organizations, et cetera, et cetera. Have a think about all those things. They can be very important to the rest of the world. They can form, especially for players, factions and races can be very important because it can help them shape their characters and how they're actually building them and everything else. And they'll often be related to the world history and everything else as well. Uh, important... 
locations. So for this, I'm meaning more things like major cities. What even is that? Major cities, monuments, natural wonders, general geography, you know, uh, mountain ranges. What are the important locations in your world? What is the stuff that people have warred over? What is the stuff that has been sacred and protected by magic or the gods? Um, what are the important locations to each race? That sort of thing. Are there monuments? Are there natural wonders? All things to think about. Um, as a subset of this, whoop, uh, important NPCs. Um, related to each location, major cities, who's the ruler, who's the government, what do they do? Uh, if it's um, you know a sacred grove, who's the important NPCs there? These can also be tied to world history. Who are the important figures from history? Are they relevant today? Are they not? Think about stuff to think about. And then finally, artifacts. Artifacts, I think... Magic items is one of the thing which is super cool about Dungeons and Dragons. And if you're creating a custom world, you've got to think about, you know, what are the legendary items? What, are this, what is the stuff of legend? Think about the Excaliburs, the Spear of Destiny, the Shroud of Turin. These legendary things that people might want to try and find. The Ark of the Covenant, um, the Holy Grail. You should have these things in your world because these are things that cool stories can be formed around. Um, so important to have a think about these, where they are. In fact, yeah, let's write this down. What, where, and then also why. Why have they been lost? Why ha Why would anybody want to go after them? Um, et cetera, et cetera. So really useful to think about all of that there. That's all I'm going to cover on World Notes because we are going to talk about each of these things individually and we can go over it more and more there. And that is pretty much it for this episode of DM101. I want to wrap things up because, as I said, it's going to turn into a long video. Your homework for this week, if, you are, if you're interested in doing homework, you don't have to. Um, obviously, it's a little exercise. Um, go home. Think about how you can employ a lot of this into your own session notes. Maybe draft up your next session using these. No, in actual fact, I'm going to change it. We're not going to do that for homework. Your homework is your cheat sheets. I want you to go back. I want you to come up with cheat sheets for NPC names, NPC motivations, and interesting vignettes. Write a bunch of them. Get a bunch of them done now while you've got some free time. They will prove very, very useful to you down the road. So there's your homework. I want you to work on your own cheat sheets. Make sure you do those. Um, and that is pretty much it. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget, you can check out more DM101 episodes in the playlist. All the videos and stuff get linked down below. Come and watch High Rollers if you want to see me DMing in action. Um, you can also check out the back catalogue on Yogs Live. If you'd like to see more of me DMing, there's a really cool video series coming out from my friends at Shut Up and Sit Down. They're an awesome YouTube channel. They've been covering board games for years. I'm a big fan of their content. They also have all their videos up on their website. I ran a game of Dungeons and Dragons, a completely homebrew world, completely custom adventure. Um, I ran that for them um, with uh, Matt, Lees, Quinns, and Pip. Really, really funny. Really, really good time. I really enjoyed it. And um, that's over on their channel. I will link it in the video description below. And I'll probably throw it in the end card and uh, maybe the, the cards as well. So please do go and check that out. Uh, and yeah, so make sure you watch that. And that's pretty much it from me. Thank you very much. I'm sorry this video was a little bit late. I did have some audio uh, technical issues. Hopefully those have been fixed for this recording. It sounds okay to me. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for all your support. Don't forget to check out all the Patreon and uh, Twitch and everything else. Uh, there's all in the description below. Um, uh, like and subscribe. Share this around if you think it will be useful to people. And thanks very much for watching. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.